So I want to start today uh, at the dark ages of medicine, which is all of just 150 years ago, uh, the mid-19th century. It was a time when medicine could do not much for people, couldn't, couldn't really uh, offer any cures for disease, couldn't really offer any therapies for disease, certainly couldn't offer much explanation for disease, the causes of disease. Most disease at the time, most of what afflicted um, humanity was infectious disease, stuff like uh, cholera, influenza, and tuberculosis, consumption, the subject of this painting uh, from about 1880 by Cristobal Rojas. Consumption was different, though. It was different than the other uh, uh, infectious diseases of the time, where those other infectious diseases were, were epidemic. They would, they would kind of flare up in the population, uh, cause a lot of mortality, and then, and then fade away. Tuberculosis was endemic. It was always there, always chipping away at the population. In fact, 25% of mortality in the 19th century was related to consumption. And if you do the math, that means about 50% of the population would have suffered from the disease at some point, and fully 100% of the population would have been exposed to the bacteria, would have, would have been carrying the bacteria. Now, they didn't know that it was caused by bacteria. This is the culprit, the Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and this is the man who discovered it, Robert Koch, a German scientist, and uh, this is a footnote from history, right? This is, if you've, if you've done any epidemiology or you've done any med school, you may have come across this in one or two sentences. But this is a very important moment in, in not just medicine, but in the kind of world of innovation in general, because what we have here is a complete reversal from a a very convinced world of ignorance to a world of somewhat enlightenment that we live in today, right? A world where they believed that germs could not exist. They were considered, at best, imps of the scientific imagination, as one wag put it. And now, today's world, we have the five-second rule, we have Purell dispensers in our grocery stores, We've actually, in some ways, gone too far against germs, right? I mean, we've, we've so purified our world that we've maybe caused all sorts of other things. So how do we get from that world to the world we're in today? How do we make that shift? How did science convince the world to make that shift? Well, you might think it's as easy as somebody like Robert Koch, some genius, looking under his microscope, having that eureka moment, and then, lo and behold, society wakes up the next day and we're in a new age. It's the stuff of scientific revolutions, right? Well, it's not that easy at all. In fact, it's a much more complicated process, a much more convoluted process, and a much more rigorous process. This is something that we came up with at, at my years at Wired, and it's, it's kind of this series of hoops that I call the arc of innovation. What happens is it, it really just starts with the discovery. The discovery is only the starting point. We have to then, a discovery has to be turned into a technology, it has to be turned into a tool, it has to be an implement, it has to be wielded in some way. And then that technology has to be industrialized. It has to have some kind of, commercial, uh, kind of commercial apparatus, commercial implication, so that it can actually potentially start to change the fabric of people's everyday lives. And only when it reaches that stage, only when it's gone through all these other hoops, can it start, can a discovery start to maybe change society. So this is a very intricate process, and it's one that I, I think is not only something that is marked by the, by the germ theory, but if you think about many discoveries, many kind of revolutions of our day, they have their, their kind of, they followed this pattern. You could look at something like the agricultural revolution, the green revolution. Started with a, a uh, observation by, by botanists about, about how plants grow, that turned into herbicide, that became an industrial shift in agriculture, and that became this age of abundance in terms of foodstuffs, and that lo and behold, has had some implications in terms of obesity and other things. But that's a kind of example of how it follows through that process. Another example is maybe robotics, right? So robotics are this, are this technology that has been turned into lots of industrial implications, um, but we haven't quite passed from that industrial implication to a social implication, unless you have a Roomba. Um, but, but other than those of us who haven't quite got under the robot kick yet, you know, we don't have our self-driving cars yet. So, so that's, a, that's sort of some examples, but I want to go back to the germ theory because I think it's one of the most profound examples because science is not about that first moment. It's about the rules and the process that we use to explore ideas, and then about the rules and the process that we use to disseminate ideas. Those are the important keystones of true innovation. So let's go back to Koch. Koch was an a anonymous doctor. He was a wannabe. Uh, he had great ambition. Uh, he thought he could be something. Uh, 
when his wife, uh, he lived in a, a small town in eastern Germany called Wolstein, and when his wife had squirreled away a few dollars, or probably Deutschmarks, I don't know if they had Deutschmarks, but whatever they had then, the currency, she offered to buy him a carriage so he could better visit his patients or a microscope. And he chose... The microscope, yes, okay, you're with me. So he chose the microscope, and then one day a police officer uh, knocked on his door and, and brought him the carcass of a dead sheep. So this was very clearly the work of, of anthrax. This was, Volstein was an agricultural town, a lot of sheep, and, and anthrax was a known disease, but it wasn't known what caused this disease. So Koch took his microscope and he began an experiment. He took the blood from the sheep and put it um, under the microscope, and he saw that though the sheep was dead, this blood was very much alive, right? It was teeming with life. They were, they were microbes, they were bacteria, they were what they called at the time animacules. But that wasn't enough. That, a lot of people had looked under microscopes before and seen animacules, seen, seen even things that, that they called bacteria. But it, that wasn't enough to prove that that was the cause of disease. In fact, it was a stalemate. You could say that they were the cause of disease, but you could just as easily and probably more plausibly argue that they were, they were the result of the disease, right? So no scientist had been able to break past that stalemate. So Koch started an experiment. He took that blood and he cultured it, or those, those animals, those animacules, and he cultured them in the liquid of a cow's eye, a cow's eye that he got from the local slaughterhouse. And lo and behold, they, they, they spawned in that, that liquid. And so he took that and he injected it into a mouse, uh, that he had caught in the barn behind his house, and that mouse died. And then he in removed some blood, cultured the microbes again, injected in another animal, and again, and again, and again, and after 5, 10, 20, 30 animals, finally, he had a chain of causation, a chain of evidence, that now stood as the first determinant proof that germs had caused disease. That discovery, Koch's discovery of the anthrax bacteria was the first proof, it was the first shift from where we were going from a germ theory to something like a germ fact. But it was only that discovery. An important part of Koch's process was that he that soon became to create new technologies and tools to, to push this science forward. The white lab mouse came from Koch's work. The story goes that his daughter Gertrude was, received a couple white mice as pets, and Coke, needing animals, the barn behind his house had run out of mice, so he took those white lab mice and their spawn, and he stole his daughter's pets, and they became the white lab mouse. Uh, so too with the Petri dish. The Petri dish was invented by an assistant in his lab, uh, Julius Petri, who had the insight that, that the dish culture would work better if it had sides on it. Right? So this was the creation of the apparatus, the creation of the infrastructure that became what we know as in vitro science, right? science under glass. This is where these rules came from. Koch created this method, famously his postulates. This was a protocol, a very strict protocol that was invented at this time. It was important that science have a rule base and a process. So what did he do? He deployed them, finally, against the greatest disease of the age. In 1882, he announced the discovery of the tuberculosis bacillus, and this was a triumph that the, set the world on fire. So you see in this, in this woodcut of the time, the, the snake is labeled uh, bacillus tuberculosis. The horse, the engine of his discovery, uh, the saddle says investigation. So it's the method. And in his hand, his weapon, his lance, is the microscope. So that's how powerful this idea was. That's how Koch was able to take his discoveries and, and, and make them technologies, make them tools. But what he wanted was more, right? He wanted to have more than just kind of ab abstract laboratory insights. He wanted to change people's lives. And here, he was outdone by his great rival in Paris, Louis Pasteur. Pasteur was better at it than Koch was. Not in the discovery part, but in the lab part. After all, we call it pasteurization, not cocization, right? That's a process for, for purifying what, uh, a, a process that Pasteur invented to purify wine and beer of microbes, because the wine and beer industry paid him to do it. That process ultimately would be used to, to rid milk of tuberculosis bacteria. So he was one-upping Coke, and Coke was jealous. He got even more jealous in 1885 when Pasteur announced that he had a vaccine for rabies, the rabies virus. So here was the greatest discovery that medicine come up with since Jenner and his vaccine for smallpox a century before. Pasteur was able to create something that finally could touch people's daily lives. You could get bitten by a rabid animal 
get the vaccine and not get rabies, not, get, not die. This was a profound reversal in the course of human experience, and Pasteur had done it, and Koch wanted that glory. And so, in 1890, he looked for it. He announced that he had a cure, or a heilmittel, a remedy for tuberculosis. It was called tuberculin. It was a secret remedy. He wouldn't say it was inside. But here was the, one of the greatest scientists of the day announcing that he had a cure for the worst disease of the day. And what do you think the world did? The world went wild. They went crazy. They were so excited. People with tuberculosis flocked to Berlin. They filled up the trains, they filled up the hospitals, they filled up the hotels, they filled up the coffee shops. Berlin was overrun with consumptives, all wanting a dose of Koch's cure. And so began the greatest experiment on humans in history up to that point, the biggest experiment that had ever been done. They started applying it, but, but there were no rules. Does this look like a double-blind experiment to anybody? There are seven pairs of eyes on this fellow, and this is actually a, a, an image of the, of the remedy being administered. There were no rules, no protocols. The doses varied widely. They would give it in five milligrams, 10 milligrams, 100 milligrams. It was given to the old. It was given to the, the people on death's door. It was given to people in the prime of life. It was given to children. It was given to newborns. And because the secret remedy was actually denatured tuberculosis bacteria, dead bacteria mixed with glycerin, and because everybody, pretty much everybody, had been exposed to the bacteria in their lives, well, it provoked an immune response. And so there was a high fever, there was, there was vomiting, there was diarrhea, this would last for days, and in some cases, it was even fatal. So the spectacle of this experiment, this experiment without rules, as people started to realize that they had unleashed this kind of crazy experiment, they realized that maybe this was something that they didn't want to get into. One scientist in New York called it the greatest scientific and medical delusion of our time. And so they called for the evidence to be called in, to be brought into Berlin, and it did not look good for Koch. The remedy, in fact, didn't help anyone. He had mistaken this immune response for a curative response, but it didn't cure anybody. And so Koch soon had fled Europe and, and moved to Africa, or, or spent time in Africa studying infectious disease, where he wouldn't be distracted by politics, as he said, he would then, to his embarrassment, watch an assistant receive the Nobel Prize in Medicine before he finally got the award in 1905. But here's the tragedy, here's the irony, is that in the absence of rules, what became evident was that there needed to be better rules for what we now call in vivo science, science in the body, right? So all the things that Koch lacked, randomized controlled trials, uh, placebos, double-blind experiments, uh, informed consent, all of those rules that we now accept and, and swear by as a process by which we can experiment on humans ethically and responsibly, and a method that we can trust the results, well, we didn't have those then. Now we do. And here's another tragedy. The another tragedy is that Koch actually did have a cure. It was knowledge. It was the knowledge of the bacteria. If you look at the rates of TB, the death rates, the mortality, this is an example from New York City, but it's similar around the world. From 1882, his discovery, for the next years, it's a precipitous decline in, in mortality cases, right? There was this huge drop-off, and that's because the word spread. People started to change their behavior. They stopped spitting in the sidewalk. They started washing their hands. Sales of soap went up fivefold from 1850 to 1900. And if by the time an actual cure came in 1950, which is the last year of this chart, cases were, and that was streptomycin, an antibiotic, but by the time that streptomycin arrived, cases were just a fraction of what they had been a few years before, right? Now, what we have is that finally, Coke wasn't around to see it, but finally that the, the impact started to reach society. The impact of this big idea started to actually reach society. And this is where I want to leave you with one other uh, idea and one other kind of science. Because the method that was going on here, this idea of, of getting people engaged in new behaviors, it was a very passive one. It was one of passive observation. It's kind of traditional epidemiology. But now, right now, 2014, we stand on the threshold of a new kind of science, not of, of passive observation, but of active participation. If we can engage people in sharing their experiences, sharing their lives, sharing their data, we have the potential to create new insights and new discoveries. I'm going to venture to call this in vitae science, science in real life. And this is an incredibly powerful shift. 
I think it's the most powerful force in science of the last 50 years. In vitae science is when we collaborate. It's when we build together. It's what's happening at, at patients like me and 23andMe with their patient uh, research platforms into Alzheimer's or ALS. It's what's happening at the Personal Genome Project, George Church's project out of Harvard. In vitae science is an incredibly powerful force for change and force for discovery. But just like in vitro science, just like in vivo science, we need rules. If you look at what Facebook did a few months ago, remember this, when Facebook was experimenting on its users? It's analogous, but they didn't really have the rules that we need. We can't depend on traditional terms of service or privacy policies. We can't have lawyers write the rules of science. If we're going to go into this world, we need to write the rules. We live in a more connected, more instrumented, and more quantified world. In this world, it is up to us, all of us, to make sense of the data. It is up to us and all of us to make up those rules. And it is up to all of us to make the discoveries. Thanks very much.